is my pleasure to introduce another great futurist of our day, um, actually extremely respectable and long-lived and well-known futurist of our day. Uh, That's Jerome C. Jerry Glenn. He um, is a futurist who served on the exec as the executive director, serves as the executive director of the Millennium Project. He's been the executive director of the American Council for the United Nations University and the deputy director of Partnership for Productivity International. He has been at this for 50 years, since the 1970s. I think you'll find he is an extraordinary speaker and he will be speaking to us today on the future of humanity in 2050. Thank you. I think there are two great technological trends uh, that we are going to see converge maybe in our lifetime. One is that humans are becoming cyborgs. So you got two great trends, humans becoming cyborgs and the built environment becoming intelligent. And in these two trends uh, will emerge into conscious technology we figure easily before 2050, but at least by 2050. So the distinction between consciousness and technology becomes a continuum. Like right now, we think we're talking and communicating between Washington DC and Madrid. Well, actually we're not. We're going through a bunch of machines and machines and machines, but we have adapted to the situation that we are talking to each other. We've created a mental visual space that actually is a whole bunch of machines in the middle, but we see it as a continuum. So imagine that continuum on a, on a global basis with essentially all people and not all of technology, but an awful lot of it. One of the things that futurists uh, should do, or the, one of the businesses of futures research, is to give a framework for thinking about change, how things are going, a framework in which to make better decisions. So here's one of those frameworks. Um, <clears throat> we've got in the agricultural age, of course, the product was food, industrial age was machines, <clears throat> information and service in the information economy. And we'll be increasingly moving into linkage as the primary product. How do we link uh, your socks, electronic socks and smart socks to an airplane ticket? Pretty bizarre, right? But you go to an airport in the future, and if your blood pressure is not right, picked up by electronic socks from your insurance company, sending a note to seeing where you are, seeing that you're in an airport going on without airlines and the airline come back to take, it says, ah, we need to see you take two aspirin tablets before we give you a boarding pass. So that's what I mean. Like, imagine everything connected. Whatever is not connected yet is all kinds of new business opportunities. The original power, controlling people, bringing them together was religion then nation states grew on top of that. It didn't replace religion, it said created new kind of power. A good example of this is the painting of Napoleon where he's taking the crown out of the religious leader's pillow and putting it on his own head saying, I am the one that does that. So this in a sense symbolically is that transition. And then corporations now are growing power beyond the nation state in new kinds of ways and then eventually the individual in the conscious technology age. Wealth was originally determined by land, then by capital, and now increasingly by access. And eventually being will be wealth. You're a wealthy being if you're connected to the world. If you've got all these basic things done, what do you need? What do you, what do you need is excitement. What you need is life. What you need is interest. And your being becomes a, a source of wealth. Place, earth, resources, moves to factory and offices, and then increasingly motion. Notice each one of these, by the way, has more uh, flexibility as you move down towards the future. Uh, I won't go, go a whole lot, well, cyclical time, people keep saying even today that there's nothing new under the sun, but we all know in this conference that there's plenty of new stuff under the sun, but it used to be a cycle because it was just agricultural. When you, when you plant, when you reap, it was a cycle. Then of course, with the linear production, the Ford Motor Company lines, straight line projections, we start to think that way. Now, increasingly, everything becomes flexible in time. And eventually, we'll get to the point where time becomes an invention. We'll live in many different uh, time periods. One of the things I'd, I'd like you all to try is come up with what you think are the most important technologies or future events. Uh, 
and then put them down one side of a column and then repeat them across the top. And uh, then you fill in these little boxes, like in this, this example, if synthetic biology continues to go as we think it's going to go, how will that affect or change nanotechnology? Which can be the reverse. I mean, how will nanotechnology influence synthetic biology? The reason I bring this up is this is a good thing trick that futurists use or should use, is things do interact with each other, but we have a hard time keeping track of all those interactions. This is an easy way to do that. So I guarantee you that if you do this, either this particular chart or create your own, that I am, I guarantee you that you will come up with new thoughts because your brain has a tremendous amount of information, but it hasn't done, hasn't wired everything up completely yet. Um, but this is a good thing trick for you, for you to try out to, to take a look at future possibilities. Now, we know that increasing uh, artificial intelligence can pretty well aggravate a lot of the ex uh, economic trends that some people are experiencing. Uh, we hope that we are going to change some policies and change some activities, and that's one of the purposes I assume for this conference. But right now, AI is going to worsen the situation. Concentration of wealth is increasing, and increasingly so, more so because of AI, narrow AI. The income gaps are widening. Employmentless economic growth seems to be the new norm. Return on investment in capital and technology is usually better than on labor. Future technologies can replace much of human labor. Long-term structural unemployment is a business-as-usual surprise-free trend forecast. That's a serious one. So what do we do about this? Well, what the Millennium Project did is that we studied other people's studies on the future of work and technology and made up a list of questions that were either not asked that should have been or answered badly. Like usually they said the only thing to do is increase science and technology education, as if by 2050, all people will be employed in that area. Not necessarily like. So we got to do more than just that. Also, you'll maybe not be surprised, this is a relatively sophisticated audience here, not one study, we read at least 30 to 50, not one study on the future of technology and work mentioned synthetic biology at all. And synthetic biology, as many of you know, could very well be a bigger deal than even the industrial revolution, but it was left out. So a lot of these studies, and they also were tended to be very short range, they were tended to be five years, in, 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 in one sector or one country. So we thought it was important to go out to 2050 and do global because it, in a 2050, you have enough mental room to like think about new economic possibilities, new technological possibilities. Five years doesn't give you that same freedom. So we created three technologies, uh, three scenarios. Um, and by the way, pause. Scenarios that many futurists and others share are not scenarios. They are descriptions of a future condition. Description of a future condition is a perfectly reasonable thing to do, but it misses the original point of creating a scenario. I know I worked off and on with Herman Kahn for over 10 years, who invented all this stuff. The reason for doing a scenario wasn't simply to describe a future state. It was to write a story that connects the present to a future condition with cause and effect links to find out what you didn't know. Because as you go along, you say, wait a minute, I have no idea what happens next. That's good. You stop writing, you research to find out what is a plausible next step. And, and you, that, that learning is missed when you simply describe four or five different future conditions. It's easy to do that. Writing a scenario that connects it up, that's difficult. Now, these scenarios we wrote, each one is about 10 pages with cause and effect links, how you connect up these things. And when I found out I didn't know, I stopped. For example, I in scenario three, we talk about, uh, and one to some degree, about universal basic income. Okay, where is? how do you know it's gonna be financially sustainable? Well, you know by doing a cash flow projection. So I figured, okay, maybe Finland's got a cash flow projection. No. Nope. Ah, maybe Italy's got one. No. Nope. 
maybe Switzerland's. No, I found out that nobody had done a cash flow projection. Well, that was important to know. So we had to figure out what are the variables to make a cash flow projection work and to make it sustainable. And in and, 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 and this scenario, one of the scenarios here, we showed it didn't look like it could work until about 2030 for, for several reasons. One, you got, actually it was 2035, I think it was. One, because you got new technologies that have no income, taxable income. And two, because of the new technologies, a lot of things become less expensive. So those two curves can cross over. Um, so the first scenario assumes that we have stupid decisions and we have intelligent decisions like today. So there's a lot of change between here and 2050, but the dynamic of decision-making doesn't change that much. So we got a lot of good stuff and bad stuff, and a lot of the applications are good and bad. It's a detailed scenario. Again, 10 pages, a lot of rich, just, I'd like you to read this. It's, it's rich. The second one, if you have friends that are too optimistic, have them read the second scenario. This is where governments didn't do things right, corporations didn't do things right, education didn't do things right. And, and so we ended up with a very bad situation of, of, of a lot of institutional systems collapsing and organized crime growing and militias growing and it's just a, really a bad, bad deal. So that this is good for your people that are not taking into account a lot of the negative stuff. Scenario three is where everything works fine. So if you get too depressed by reading scenario two, jump over to scenario three. Now, we put all these into uh, uh, a package and then gave them to our no chairs like Jose and others around the world and said, all right, have people read the scenarios and then do a workshop. We did about 30 workshops around the world in I think 20 countries. And the idea was to say, okay, after reading the scenarios, what does this mean for our country? What should we do about this? What should we do in education? What should we do in business? What should we do in government? So we divided up into five categories and the, 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 the meetings were like organized in these five categories. So we ended up with I don't know, hundreds of suggestions from around the world, which we distilled down to about 90 some odd uh, actions. And then we did five separate Delphi studies one for government, one for business. So we divided them up because you can't ask people to rate and analyze uh, 90s actions. It would be too much. So we divided them up into sections. So you end up with a report that not only has the three scenarios, but also has the assess uh, 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 assessment, what's practical, what's not practical, how it works, how it doesn't work, of 93 different actions. So this is a very extensive report. I do hope you'll take a look at it. Um, now, during this, we make a distinction of three different kinds of artificial intelligence. Now, I grant you that making three clear distinctions is not quite right because there will be a lot of overlaps and a lot of different subunits and so forth of artificial intelligence. But just to make an overview simple, we say artificial narrow intelligence has a single purpose. It does machine learning. It does all that sort of stuff you're talking about. But the AI that beats Go does not drive a car. Etc. Artificial general intelligence, though, is much more uh, broad in its ability to do novel problem solving that can't be done just in the narrow thing. Now, as you know, we don't necessarily have that, but on the other hand, there's a race going on between the United States and China and the European Union and Russia and organized crime and Japan. Uh, on how to get to this space. So I don't know where it is, because sometimes military intelligence is a little further down the road in technology than we think. But in any case, we don't have it in public yet. And then, of course, artificial superintelligence potentially emerges from general. And the difference is it sets its own rules. That's what science fiction is warning about. Now, the reason I make these distinctions is when people talk about AI and they talk about the consequences, you got to keep asking them. Are you talking about narrow, general, or super? Because the stuff that Stephen Hawking and the rest of these guys are warning about is super. They're not warning about, they're not talking about narrow intelligence, they're talking about super. And that's that, that's the big issue. So we already have, and when people say general AI is human level, well, depends on what you're talking about, because we already narrow intelligence already has surpassed human level intelligence and in lip reading flying uh, planes, driving cars, mathematics, live voice translation, playing games, face recognition, uh, medical diagnosis, some uh, reading comprehension speed, legal analysis, income tax preparations, 
organizing shipping, uh, specific research such as you know, Google and uh, Alexa, traffic navigation, and AI robotics for repetitive tasks and large scale data analysis. Those are already beyond human level, but that's still narrow because it's still in one category. Now, during the uh, 60s and 70s and 80s, as the information technologies and communication technologies got uh, more sophisticated, uh, we ended up saying ICT, because you couldn't keep saying, you know, packet switching, uh, chip manufacturing, you know, it was just too much. So we just lump it all together and say ICT. We're gonna have to do that the same. I would suggest you consider this, the same for next technologies. Because NT, next technologies, means artificial narrow in general, intelligence, robotics, synthetic biology, genomics, computer science, cloud data, big, uh, uh, data analytics, artificial augmented reality, nanotechnology, two kinds. By the way, the coin we have today is big machines making little things. We haven't done the Eric Drexler stuff yet of little things making big things yet, but hopefully that'll be coming along. Uh, artificial, uh, the uh, internet of things, tele everything, tele everybody, semantic web, quantum computing is going very rapidly faster than the previous forecast. Uh, telepresence, holographic communications, intelligence augmentation, uh, collective intelligence, blockchain, 3D and 4D printing of materials and biology, drones, driving the stars, conscious technology, and synergies among all these things. Now, that's too much to keep saying. So when we write these scenarios about saying impacts of very new kinds of technologies, it's just too much to keep doing that. So we said, so throughout the scenarios, we talk about NT, just like we talk about ICT. Now, a lot of talk about massive unemployment and general intelligence hits and um, the need for universal basic income. A lot of people have said, no, wait a minute, you futurists have told us this kind of stuff in the past. You know, when we're going from the agricultural age and then into the industrial age, you know, and you got all these farmers unemployed, and then you go to the information age, and all these factory people unemployed. It's all this unemployment stuff, but it never happens. You always end up creating more jobs than you replace. Well, what's different this time? And there's a lot different this time. And I think you should know this because when, when people sort of argue against you, you these are seven points uh, that are good. Acceleration of technological change is by itself, as you well know, a big deal. Driving a car at five miles an hour is different than 500 miles an hour. It makes a big difference. Two, globalization, interaction, and synergies among the NTs. That's new. I mean, your, your cell phone is a calendar, is a flashlight. It's, you know, more and more of these things get integrated faster and faster and faster. That was not around before, which means it's knocking off the calendar producers. It knocks out the flashlight producers, et cetera. That's a lot of knocking out as you integrate technologies and rapidly so. The existence of a global platform, this is really significant. In the 1980s, when I was running around the third world, putting in or helping people put in packet switching, for, which became the backbone and the, and the uh, technological backbone for the low cost of internet, uh, I had to get in a jet plane, I had to stay in a hotel. But now, since we already have the internet, we can transfer technology with a keystroke very fast. And as the information goes across, you don't have the same errors. I mean, what happens if I wrote an email incorrectly or I did an explanation incorrectly, uh, getting in the airplane the wrong time, whatever. There's errors in, in human, you know, a lot of this or the transfer stuff. But as you have a platform to double check and, and compare up around the world, that is new. It's, 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 it's a new game to have global learning technology simultaneously. That wasn't around before. Standardization of databases and protocols. I know that's boring, but it means that we can do science much faster. And we can get greater insights much faster than we ever did before. I mean, you all know about grid computer and internet and ET at home. You know, you can have thousands of more, millions of computers simultaneously doing some matching some stuff to really improve uh, scientific breakthroughs, like making a supercomputer almost free of charge. Hugh plateaus. This is a little bit trickier to understand, but like the laptop I'm using right now, yes, has more computational power, correct. But it still has a little keyboard in front, still has a little screen here. 
And that's what I had in 1992. A lot of years. So I've gotten used to the idea of putting it under my arm, sticking it in an attache case, going off somewhere. I adjusted to that. I, I got used to it. Uh, but if the technologies increasingly change their, their ways of, 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 of being produced and being consumed and using, it is all that constant change. You don't have as much cultural ad uh, adjustment to the, to the change. It cause more confusion. Billions of empowered people in relatively democratic free markets able to initiate activities. That's a big deal because that also is another source of change. More and more people can create more and more new, th new things, more and more ideas, more and more institutions, more and more agreements, more and more tools, et cetera. That means the complexity of the system is rapidly increasing as well. And seven, and not the least, <laughs> Machines can learn what you do and then do it better than you. So these three, seven things together, in my estimate, says why it's different this time than in the past. A little a couple, a couple words on this idea of scenario three, which is if humans were free, the self-actualizing economy. If we get to a point, uh, 2030, 2035 or so, where we do have um, uh, a basic income, some not a great deal, but enough, so that you're not thrown in the street. Because the old social contract was, you go to school, you do well, you get a job, you do well, and then we give you some money to retire on, so you're okay. That's the old social contract. But if you're thrown in the street, I'm getting that feedback again. Uh, if you're thrown in the street uh, because of, all this new technology, and the, the social contract breaks down. Can we get rid of that feedback again? It was doing quite well there for a while, but now it's started again. Okay, thank you. Um, so if people have the basic needs taken care of, the basic income, and they're not thrown in the street, that frees up the ability for a person to say, well, I don't have to desperately run out for a job. I can think about what I'd like to do. So if more and more people had their basic needs met and their love and longliness needs met by social media for better or for worse, then eventually we move into the self-actualization stage, that you start to make a living being who you want to be. I mean, between birth and death, maybe not death, but anyway, so far death, between birth and death, are you just an economic animal fitting into the system? Or can you actually be a creative mind? Can you make a living out of being a creative mind? Well, what's unique about your interests? How can you connect to markets worldwide? In the past, you had to have your job right here. You had to walk to it or bicycle to it or commute to it or somehow. You, did, you didn't have employers in the sense of markets worldwide. Now you can do that potentially. What are you, think of yourself as a holding company. How many things, things are you? And how many markets are there for each of those things of you? Is that enough for you to like invent yourself on an ongoing basis? That seems to be plausibly in evolving. Now, in order for that scenario, that evolution to work, several things. One, governments have to anticipate the impacts of artificial general intelligence. They're not doing that. I'm reading these national AI strategies and they're really talking about narrow intelligence. They're not really talking about general. If they put in a couple of paragraphs here and there, just uh, some lip service, but there's no real grasping of the difference between narrow and general. To me, the difference between narrow and general is like in the information age, the difference between a fax machine and the internet. Both are part of ICT, but the impact of the internet is a lot different than the fax machine. I think it's that kind of scale the governments do not have in their, their gut yet. And, but in this scenario, they slowly begin to realize and early understand that this is a big deal coming up and we've got to start to prepare for it. So they conduct extensive research on how to phase in universal basic income. We've got to think this through fully. This is a major change in the history of civilization. We've never had that kind of an idea before that everybody gets the basics of money for food, shelter, and clothing. That's new, new, new in the world. How does that change our philosophy of life? How does that change the way we have our relationships? 
And then back to that cash flow projection. You know, how do we really make it financially sustainable and so forth? So it needs time and research to go through it. There's been a lot now, but not sufficient to come up with that old cash flow projection I keep talking about. But in this scenario, they go through all this. They take their time and they phase it in in a way that works for people. Increasing intelligence becomes a goal of education. I don't need to explain it to this crowd. We know there's a lot of ways to make ourselves more intelligent, but we don't integrate it into the classroom yet. Self-employment is promoted. The idea of creating your own life is very scary for most people. They want the security of an identity. I am an economist employed by the IMF. They want to have their boss say them who they are, how they fit in. That makes them feel safe and secure. Well, the idea of being naked to the world is that creating yourself, that's hard for most people. So we need to help people make this mental transition. And that becomes the artists and media moguls and entertainers that help foster a culture uh, of change from employment culture to a self-actualization economy. We need movies, we need theaters, dance, all that sort of stuff. Uh, in the 60s and 70s in the United States, much of the cultural changes trace back to music and the words in the music. There was no accident. A lot of people were pushing social change through the music. We got to do the whole thing through virtual reality systems, online systems, to show people this transition is possible and it's a desirable sort of a transition. If it doesn't, people will have a hard time with identity. They'll have a hard time in insecurity. And mental illness could be uh, very persuasive in that. Now, one of the nice little things uh, is the, the idea of the AI, personal AI avatar that goes running around the internet, comes up with all kinds of things with you in the morning and says, hey, I found 50,000 things for you to do. I know you can't do all 50 of them, but I took the liberty of making smart contracts with 15 that will actually make you some money if you approve, and 15 that are cool to do just because is self-actualization. You just want to be yourself in the last rest of So this seems to be an inevitable tool coming up, but I would say it's, it's critical for the self-actualizing economy because it helps you, because basic universal income is just enough. I mean, it's not a whole lot. It's just enough to keep you out of, the, out of trouble. But if you want to really grow, you know, your, your AI avatar will help you in that way, both for self-actualization and then for the incomes uh, with that. What's going on, I believe, is, is uh, a little bit like the autonomic nervous system of the human body. We've developed this system that allows us to digest our food, uh, to do all the things we're supposed to do with our body without paying attention to it. We need to do this with civilization as a whole. You know, the, the, the waste problem, the energy problem, the water problem, all these sort of things of a civilization. How much of this an awful lot, can be automated through AI? So we create this autonomic nervous system so that we free up civilization to reinvent itself new, to create, be more creative. Now, all of that was narrow intelligence. General intelligence, as I said, as you know, is a bigger deal. That's more creative, uh, problem solving, new kinds of creativity, all of that, the new, new growth area. Uh, and then in super intelligence, to me, the difference between super and general is that super can set its own goals, set its own purposes, independent of human understanding and independent of our uh, awareness. So final warning here to be taken on is that the, if you don't have the initial conditions right, or artificial general intelligence, then, super, then as superintelligence evolves from general, it could evolve in a way that the science fiction writers have warned us about. So I think the only chance we have in this game is the intervention between narrow and general, how that transition occurs. And we need a global governance system for that. Now, some people will argue and have, you're way too premature for this. You know, you, you, you can't put a bunch of rules that'll stifle in, a, in a, you know, you know blah, blah. He said, wait a minute, you forget. We don't even have a global governance system for climate change. 
I mean, it, it takes a long time to get international treaties done, to get mechanisms in place, et cetera. I figure if it, it takes at least 10 years to create a global governance system for the initial conditions to manage that, manage that and have audit rules and all the rest of that stuff. And I sit on the I- IEEE uh, uh, committee for governance, on organizational governance of AI. And, and we're going through incredible detail on specific definitions that you can measure and what the metrics is for each one. I mean, it's increasingly, incredibly difficult. That is nothing compared to general intelligence because the system of governance has to be able to move and be flexible beyond the normal static thing like the International Atomic Energy Agency. So anyway, if it's gonna take 10 years or more to create such a governance system, which would be important so that we have some control over how super intelligence evolves, then we gotta begin now, because we don't know. You know. Ben and others will tell you, well, we could have general intelligence maybe in 10 years. Well, okay, then we gotta get going right now. And we've gotta put this together uh, with players around the world, because if you have some countries that don't participate, then a lot of nasty stuff could be created there. Uh, and we're all in trouble with that because we know we're an interdependent world when it comes to software for sure. I thank you very much. Um, I, I hope as some people are still there after all this uh, waiting. And you can get this information on this website uh, online. Thank you.